agenda for the next panel discussion we have is capacity building for ESG primary secondary and tertiary uh, the moderator joining us everyone we have policy director from Indian School of Business everyone let's please put our hands together for Dr. Arushi Jain everyone um, we have Dr. Arushi Jain she leads the education projects and outreach activities in her current role. Dr. Jain leads uh, engagements with various state governments and organizations. Thank you so much, ma'am, for joining in. Uh, going ahead, we have another panelist joining us, Executive Director, Etsil Ministry of Education, Government of India. Let's please put our hands together for Dr. Chandrasekhar, everyone. Thank you so much, sir, for joining in. Uh, he is an em uh, eminent educationist, policy planner, and institutional visioning. Uh, moving ahead, next panelist we have among us is the founder and CEO, India Leaders for Social Sector. Everyone, let's please put our hands together for Miss Anu Prasad. Everyone, uh, she's uh, prior to settling up for ILSS in 2017, uh, she was the founding deputy dean of the prestigious Young India Fellowship and a founding member of Ashoka University, India's first liberal arts university. Thank you so much, ma'am, for joining in. Next up, we have Dr. Shrikant Mohapatra. Everyone, let's please put our hands together for Dr. Shrikant. He is the Pro Vice Chancellor, IGNU, has served also as officer on special duty, OSD of Orissa State Open. Thank you so much, sir for joining in. Uh, last but not the least, another panelist we have is Miss Monica Halan. Everyone, let's please put our hands together. Chairperson SEBI Advisory Committee for IPEF. A uh, 30 years of career spans across media, public policy and financial education. Without wasting any time, let's get in the panel discussion and hear it from the panelists. Just one request, I uh, will keep time in check. Thank you. going to do that. <laughs> Hi, and a very good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we've been talking about the post lunch sessions, and uh, we do understand uh, the time limitation here. Uh, I'm going to start this very interesting conversation around capacity building for ESG. Uh, we've had uh, some bits and pieces of inputs that we got from experts since the morning. Uh, you know, Mr. Lahari spoke about uh, uh, probably starting from the home and how ESG uh, could be one of the uh, things that is imbibed in our culture itself. I think I'm going to take on from there. And uh, you know, we have to uh, probably change the societal setup when we say ESG, and that can happen with the kind of value education, with the socialization that's going to be there over years and when we say capacity building that's the next step but how do we inculcate uh, the entire uh, you know environmental societal governance framework to the young minds right at the onset so that we don't have to do special trainings for this aspect and it becomes a part of our regular um, you know regular work regular life uh, from there uh, because this is a very important aspect, there have been uh, you know, conversations, trainings around corporate governance. Uh, corporate social responsibility in itself has been big, uh, but now when it comes to ESG, uh, our corporates, the investors, the regulatory organizations, all of them are now looking at specific capacity building initiatives at all levels, be it primary, secondary, and tertiary. I have a very eminent uh, set of guests with me here today. And I'll first go on uh, to uh, Ms. Anu Prasad, the CEO of ILSS, uh, to talk about leadership and talent acquisition. And you know, how can you uh, have leaders of tomorrow uh, driving this entire agenda around ESG? And uh, I think Anu uh, has to leave also for something. So she would, uh, I would like you to speak first. Thank you so much. Thank you, yes. Thank you, everyone. And it has been wonderful. Uh, Ms. Mehta, I was hearing you and the work Honda is doing and all the incredible work. I'm very close to ISDM and I know the work they're doing in development management. So ILSS really is a social sector 
a capacity building institution that is really strengthening India's social sector. Because you know, in this whole world of Samaj, Bazaar, Sarkar, Samaj somewhere, uh, which really is you know, the crux of what ESG is all about, has gotten lost. So we launched ILS five years ago saying, how do we strengthen India's social sector, which in turn is working for some of the most challenging problems in the country today? And how we do it is very interesting. We actually run a program for senior corporate leaders. Because let's face it, these are leaders who in the last three decades have changed the face of business in India, uh, post-liberalization. So can we leverage that skill, that knowledge, to start solving for some of the most intractable problems? So whether you are within your corporate environment or you're looking at the development space, how, do, how can you, what can you do? And how do you learn? So that's, that's what we do. I was a part of Ashoka University. I'm a founder of Ashoka University. And so a big a champion of liberal arts as well. I just have a small speech, so I'm just going to read it out. Uh, the urgency for embedded sustainability practices cannot be overstated. We're in the depths of a climate crisis like none other, and its scale is enormous. We've heard about these problems over the course of the conference. For example, 39 of the 50 world's most polluted cities in the world are unfortunately in India. There are tense social political uh, politics of inclusion, exclusion, which are only getting worse, and Ravi spoke about the billionaires and the in inequality. All these problems don't exist in a vacuum. Our social, political, economic, and environmental challenges are in constant dialogue with each other, presenting us with a complex web of challenges. So therefore, at ILSS, the organization I'm at the helm of, we are committed to building a cadre of socially responsible impact leaders. The organization was created following a realization that the social sector is in need of strong leaders who are prepared to take on the nation's big biggest challenges. So our approach of capacity building is that we work with senior leaders, both corporate and social, uh, through our programs to build their understanding, build their skills, build their networks and knowledge to create innovative and sustainable solutions for greater impact at scale. Throughout the day, we've been hearing about the importance of ESD. It's, it's in the corporate sector's realization of the fact that none of us as organizations or sectors exist in a vacuum. Instead, we all have a responsibility to the people around us and the world we live in. And quite frankly, COVID really, you know, the, 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 cha the problem was that a lot of civil society had ceded spaces because, you know, I live in a gated complex. Water issues, we take care of it. Security issues, we take care of it. But there are some issues where we are all, you know, air pollution. It's, it's all our problem. No amount of privilege can make me safeguard myself. Or, you know, things like COVID. You know, COVID really threw up the fact that we need to, society needs to wake up. And not just corporates or not just nonprofits or not just government. We all have to be in it together. We believe the sector needs the best minds to solve some of the biggest challenges. So I am really here to sort of try and influence all the corporates sitting here that there is a lot to be done, a lot more to be done in terms of learning and collaborating. It needs the talent that can leverage technology, build systems and processes, understand and navigate governance and risk, project manage, and synthesize different learnings. Bringing in senior leaders from the world of business allows us to leverage that talent that has allowed businesses to thrive and scale. We also need to embed the social lens and the challenges of working in the ESG spaces within corporate leaders and decision makers so as to inform on their business decisions. We believe we must aim for both profit and purpose. Our leadership program, which is an uh, immersive boot camp we run, is a learning experience which gives senior corporate leaders the knowledge and skills they need to meaningfully transition or engage or slash tackle social issues. We see participants who are eager to contribute to the sector and use their skills to help the country. By the way, I have transitioned more than 350 corporate leaders through our programs. They just don't know how to. A lot of the corporate people I speak to almost every week say, I want to do something. I just don't know what I want. I don't know what's out there. My idea of an NGO is wading through some floods. You know, there is this myths and perceptions. In reality, it's a thriving ecosystem that's doing great work. Uh, they don't know how to. The sector is so complex and dynamic. For someone who, is, who isn't involved, it seems intimidating. Through our capacity building, we are able to work with leaders to dis demystify the, the space, explore the range of projects and policies that we are able to work on, be it through full-time transitions into the sector. So a lot of leadership from corporate today is actually leading nonprofits. So the head of Akshay Patra today that feeds three million kids a day is from Coke. 
So you know, he made the transition 20 years ago, but he was a corporate leader. Um, be it through full-time transitions, through engagement on nonprofit boards, through CSR, or even volunteering. Corporate leaders often come from an environment which prioritizes profit, efficiency, and the bottom line, which is the way it's been. The social sector is far more complicated than that. We work with leaders to shift this, this trained mentality into one which aligns more with the sector, which is essential if we are to develop impactful solutions. Like Ravi talked about mindset shifts. We work on this shift on mindset, right? Because you're coming into a much more complex problem-solving environment. We recognize the importance of cross-sectoral collaboration to achieve the, sustainable de the lofty sustainable development goals, which is why we dedicate learning pro programs. We need to build a lens of social responsibility. So when I'm talking to senior corporate leaders in my programs, we have diversity, inclusion, gender, and often the comment is, this was a blind spot. I didn't even see that I was excluding women from uh, the debate. So it's, you know, it's just giving you an extra lens and a uh, chashma to see things, right? Um, to strengthen their understanding of gender, equality, sustainability, the triple bottom line, and inclusion. And we've seen that once leaders are made aware of the depth and breadth of work to be done, it's impossible not to engage in some capacity. So the good news is once you've built that social lens, you're not going back. You're not going back because there's so much to be done and you just get, you will, volunteer, you will do something, but you will carry that with you. And we have, like I said, we've moved so many now that we know that to be a tr fact. One of the most important parts of the programs which we do, which makes it unique, is the focus on identifying our values uh, and our motivations to do this work. There's no significant components of introspection which help participants identify the, why, why it's so important to work with, for society. Because a lot of people say, I want to, uh, I want to um, give back. And we always say, don't give back, pay it forward. You have privilege, pay it forward. You know, there's a difference, you know, because give back almost comes from a savior complex or a rescue complex. Like, I'm gonna give you some. This is your society, this is your country, it's your environment, so pay it forward. Uh, they're able to build that personal connection with the, with the field they're most passionate about, the importance of values-based leadership and decision-making is underlined, and we've seen the transformative impact it has when the going gets tough, it's a very complex space to try to solve for education, nutrition, gender, inclusion. It's not easy. So sometimes it's frustrating, but I think you need to, you need to know why you're doing it. And once you know that, your inner value, you, you will soldier on. The social sector is hard. It never pays you enough. It's not as structured as we'd like. There's no ecosystem of support, yet people are there because they realize why they are there. As long as you know why you're there, that's the most important thing. Through this process and all the additions, we've had the opportunity to support leaders in organizations like the Air Pollution Action Group. And I must tell you, Air Pollution Action Group today is working with different states, has also been invited by the central government. The head of, was a marketing man. He was a head of Bharti Marketing, he was in Lintas. He went through our program. He came from very strong marketing, branding, communication, but didn't know what he could do in the sector. Today, he heads Air Pollution Action Group, working with so many state governments, where they project manage a lot of the work. But they're really adding value, right, to the, to the very dire need. Um, so many other foundations that we've now seen launch uh, in, our, in our times. Through our, we have worked with incredible organizations like the Environmental Defense Fund, Waste Warriors, I Am Gurgaon, Eco Sattva. The idea of bringing the work of leaders from the social spaces to fuel the ideas of collaboration in order to first start by being an engaged and active citizen and then to contribute meaningfully in the causes of environment, social, and governments. With clarity of values comes clarity of vision. Our work is focused on enabling senior leaders to identify their core values and the field they're most passionate about. We realize that only with this can we support them in a sustainably, in, sustainably engaging with the sector and co-building a world that is inclusive, sustainable, and just. Thank you so much for giving me this time. Thank you so much, Anu. That was uh, really nice. Uh, you also touched upon very important aspects of uh, gender diversity. And when we are developing leaders, I think these are aspects uh, that have to be considered. In fact, the entire ESG agenda should take this into consideration while you know, thinking about the entire capacity building uh, framework on the whole. So thank you so much. Uh, we next move uh, to our next panelist here with us, uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar, the executive director of EDSIL. Uh, I think Edsel is doing commendable work transforming education in India 
and also uh, I think uh, the international recognition to education that Edsel is aiming uh, at. Uh, you know, my question to you is how do you think uh, that the entire ESG uh, framework can be included in the educational institutional curriculum as a whole? And has there been any effort on that side as of now? Thank you, thank you, thanks a lot. So you see that uh, Edsel is, is one of the premier uh, consulting organizations of the Government of India and uh, we are engaged in the drafting designing of the educational programs or somewhere in pockets of excellence implementing the national education policy be it the school education or the higher education or the technical vocational education I think the point you raised is very important and very strategic in this point of time and the time of climate change and we have experienced the COVID, uh, the post-COVID, what we are happening, and the transition the government of India has taken to the in the national education policy is tremendous, and uh, progressive and aspiring also. I think you might understand. Just give you slight bits on what the educational changes, then touch upon the 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 uh, inclusion of ESG. It's very important. The right time, the government has thought about. One, bringing in the early childhood care, child care education into the mainstream. I think this, the, until now, I think it was out of the purview of the school education or the formal education system. Now it is coming up. And the government of India has already formulated the ECC curriculum with NCRT. And I think most of the states have been implementing, which I have at least witnessed through several uh, uh, periodic review missions along with the states. But the preparedness is still not there. The acceptability is slowly percolating. So it means that the society, the community has to get engaged more. And I think it's a time we welcome this change, number one, so that we are easily able to adopt. And I think our younger generations are more prepared to uh, getting into the future, whether it is climate change or sustainability or the uh, governance inclusion part of it. So that's a complete uh, change on the inclusion. When you look at the another component of the vocational education, it is also getting mainstream. I think today the academic bank of credits is already in place. It means that the students entering the formal education system or exiting out of the formal education system gain some more academic experience, again come into the mainstream of education. This kind of flexibility the academic uh, bank of credit allows, be it even in schools or education, I think we are done away with the uh, all formal assessment, terminal examinations at 10th and 12th, the new education policy, when it's completely being implemented at 2025, uh, 2030, I think the kind of student, a learner who is enrolling in the formal system will have only two exams and there is a choice of the learners to choose at uh, at age of 14, at age of 18 or at 21. So that's the kind of flexibility this system. But I think this all can happen when the society accepts, the community accepts, the learner also understands the system and be able to adopt to that. More important, I think relevant, which I wanted to mention in terms of curriculum or the change which we have been talking through the whole day and it is absolutely when important where the individual or the personnel who is engaged in these ecosystems needs to change. How that can happen? We can say a lot of technologies. The IITs have produced so much of friendly technologies. So today we talk about all uh, EV vehicles. Yes, it is there. But has we, have we analyzed that this production of electric vehicle, the kind of energy getting into it, is it exceeding the, the ecological footprints? That's a mil million dollar question, which we need to work around. But the whole thing is, it needs to get into mainstream of individuals, whether he or she is individual is involved in education, or in the kind of workplace, or in any other place, any kind of formal sector. The mainstreaming of the whole concept of sustainability, governance, 
and where social inclusion is more important. How we bring this? I think Government of India, I think there are a lot of uh, CEOs of sector skill councils. Apparently, I learned that I also did a case study for a comparison of green sector skill councils of India and few other developing countries. Very interesting to know that we have developed high standards, global standards, but in terms of acceptability or have we focused only to, uh, we have been talking about is it green means, is it only to photovoltaics, solar energy or renewable energy? Why not beyond that? Where this kind of uh, energetics is being conserved, conservation happens and becomes an inclusive part of it. Whatever you do, uh, maybe we are in the conventional, but can we do conventional also in a way that they are sustainable? It's more important. This is the kind of uh, green sector skill needs to understand. I think some of the countries have included the six key components into the sustainability factor while looking at. While India is still had made a strategy, but adopting how these kind of inclusions can come. The broader components of inclusion needs to be involved. I think that's the uh, key role which uh, we need to play. And I think it's a long way to go. I think we have started somewhere these discussions. I think many of the other formal organizations, councils, and the community is also addressing, trying to this fact. I think if you take it, put it in the right spirit, build as part of our own practices, daily part of our living, I think we, we, we should be able to change. I think these are a few of my remarks. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar. I think uh, very important issues you touched and along with that, also very subtly you brought the research angle to it. Uh, so I think a research around ESG along with the capacity building is something that is required at this stage and probably something that we can look at uh, to go along with the capacity building uh, efforts so that you know uh, there are use cases that can be taught, there are examples, case studies from the field uh, that can be uh, built in into this uh, training framework that we are talking about. And there are a lot of best practices that are already there in the you know, Indian scenario, be it the corporates or be it uh, the governmental efforts as we can just hear about it. A lot is being done, but uh, probably something that we can uh, pop, you know, promote, popularize, and uh, go further on, uh, taking the research agenda hand in hand with the capacity building thing. So thank you so much. Uh, next we go uh, to a very important aspect. Uh, all of us have witnessed the remote work, the remote learning to a great extent uh, during COVID. Uh, but uh, Dr. Shrikant Mohapatra, uh, being the pro vice chancellor of IGNU, uh, you have been doing it for uh, you know decades now. Uh, the entire um, distance education uh, framework, remote learning has been the USP of, uh, you know, IGNU. And uh, I would like you to reflect upon how we can leverage this strength on the ESG agenda and how can we think about remote learning as one of the big options that can help uh, people understand what ESG is all about and probably uh, reflect more on that. <laughs> Thank you very much. I am representing Indira Gandhi National Open University and my focus will be on what Madam has just now said, how we reach out to the last mile on the ESG agenda. Friends, uh, the university that I represent is the largest university in the world with 3.5 million students, that means 35 lakh students, 38 lakh alumni, and if we combine the students with the alumni, it is almost 83 lakhs, and if I combine their family members of four in each family, it is around three crore, and if I combine their friends, relatives, and co-workers, then it comes to around 15 crores. And we are reaching out to 15 crore people in India. Particularly, our social agenda is equity, 
access, inclusion, reaching out to all sections of the society, providing quality education at very, very affordable cost so that any student from any strata of life can really get education from a university which is the national university. We reach out to the civil caste, civil tribes, provide them free education. It is the only university in the country which provides free exemption to the students. Others give fee reimbursement. They pay the fee and then the university reimburses. But for the civil caste and civil tribes, we give them free education, particularly at the bachelor degree level. We have been serving the Indian Armed Forces for the last 25 years, Army, Navy, Air Force, and Assam Rifles. Recently, Government of India has announced a scheme for the Agnivirs, and we have prepared a scheme for the Agnivirs of the Indian Navy, Indian Army, and Indian Air Force, so that along with their military training, they will also get free, they will get education, higher education, so that by the time they come out of the armed forces, they will be employable. Now, with these objectives, the university is also reaching out to the jail inmates. We have 185 centers inside the jails, because jails are not there to punish the people. It is, these are reformatories. So in the jails also, we have our centers. So when I come to the ESG agenda, I'll, I'd like to tell you in the last three years, we have, at the undergraduate level, 10 lakh students have been told about the environmental issues in the country and the governance issues in the country at the undergraduate level. At the postgraduate level, in the last three years, 30,000 students have been admitted and they have been taught in open and distance learning mode. We are also offering long-term programs through the online platform and short-term modules in the SWAM platform of the Government of India. So by distance education, by online education, with master degree level program, undergraduate level program, certificate level program, even awareness level program on environmental issues, the university is trying to reach out to all sections of the society. I'll just give you two, three examples. Of we have a master of science in environmental science. We have a master of arts in environmental and occupational health. A master of arts in sustainability science. Master of arts in environmental studies. Then we have master of science in renewable energy and environment. We have a master of arts in corporate social responsibility. A master of arts in urban development. I'm just talking about the master's degrees. Then there are plenty of postgraduate diplomas, plenty of certificate programs, and plenty of online capsules. My only uh, submission to this audience who are mostly from the corporate world is that IGNU is also trying to reach out to the corporate world. Madam is sitting here. She was talking about her efforts in the ESG sector in uh, Honda. For the last 20 years, we have been interacting with Honda and uh, for motorcycle repairing. And we have also established some centers in the jails. I remember when I was in Gujarat, in, in uh, Ahmedabad jail and in Baroda jail, some of your senior officers at the level of vice president had come for the establishment of jail centers so that the jail inmates can also get uh, skill training. So we have been out to join hands with the corporate world, though we are in the education sector. We have now joined hands with all the 37 sector skill councils of India by signing MOU with the Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship, by signing MOU with the National Skill Development Corporation. We have been trying to reach out to the uh, sector skill councils and all these training partners and training institutions are in the corporate world. So my only request is that since Indira Gandhi National Open University caters to the underprivileged sections of the society, you will not hesitate to join hands with us and we can't pay very high fee uh, to the corporate world for providing training to the students. 
So we would request you that by applying your corporate social responsibility and by or covering under the uh, social, environmental and governance uh, spheres, you will join hands with the Indira Gandhi National Open University so that we work together and serve the society and really uh, meet the sustainable development goals which we are all supposed to achieve by 2030. Thank you very much. About, um, you know, the Dow Jones Sustainability World Index, which will include uh, companies from across the world who do well on these metrics and they will have their own methodology. So uh, they will have a filter through which the companies have to pass so that they can get included. And this, uh, the Dow Jones Sustainability World Index, has 332 global stocks. India used to have 12, now we are down to six. And this includes, uh, we still have Infosys, Vedanta, Mahindra and Mahindra, Tech Mahindra. Adani was recently removed from the index in February. So that's the global part, that we have a less than a 1% share of the market cap of this S&P ESG index in India. So, so there is a global index where some of our companies are doing well. And then there is an Indian. So the National Stock Exchange has an ESG index which tracks, which has 89 companies which go into that creation of that index. Um, then you come to the uh, point that how does a company get rated on these metrics? So Crystal will give points from zero to 100 and at 100 you are ESG perfect. Most of the companies who are in leadership roles will have a score of between 70 to 80 on the leadership front. So this is the way that you will map um, ESG through metrics which an investor can understand. Remember, the investor is looking for return. And uh, the idea has been that can you, does ESG compliance mean better profitability? Should it also show up in profits? Because when you do well by the employees, by the people, by the planet, ideally in a, uh, in a perfect world, it should end up with better profitability because you get better scores on governance. And the market, the stock market should value you for that. You know, these are very new indices. Uh, the NSE index is just a few years old. We've seen that uh, the history of performance against the broad market index is a little bit up and down. So sometimes the ESG indices do better in terms of return and sometimes they do worse. So we are, I think there, there has to be more data for us to be able to, uh, to evaluate it. For investors in India who want to participate, you have mutual funds. There are nine, at least nine funds today which run on the ESG theme. So retail investors can actually put the, your money. So if, you know, if as a society, if this group is saying that we are very, very conscious of the planet, then your investments should be going into ESG uh, uh, funds and stocks which do well on the ESG metric. So it's not just uh, on the input side, but even on the output side, that how do we invest our money? That should also then have an ESG focus. I have, uh, I'm gonna flag two things which might make me a little unpopular, but then that's, I'm used to that. Um, I, so one is that a lot of these concepts are coming to India from the West. We've been talking a lot about ESG, village level education, I think as a society, we are already, we recycle, we reuse, we don't waste. So I'm unsure of some of the lessons that the West is trying to give me when I have excellent uh, traditional practices of uh, maintaining the planet. I mean, we've lived harmoniously for uh, you know, millennia with, the, with, with uh, keeping the, these are hard-coded into, into the way of life that we have. So, that is one. So they are measuring ESG according to their metrics and they're hard coding it. And unfortunately, some of these are also becoming political weapons. So for example, 
Um, so everyone's heard of Elon Musk. He runs Tesla. He's more known for his odd eccentric behavior than for the fact that he has uh, reduced the cost of rockets to go into space by 90%. And he runs the largest green car company, which is Tesla Electric Car Company. He was last year thrown out of the Dow Jones, his company was thrown out of the Dow Jones index, whereas companies like Exxon are there, which makes me wonder as to what, one is that how is it that Dow Jones ESG index first let him in if he was non-compliant with the ESG index? And then the week that he says he's funding not Democrats and Republicans, his stock gets thrown out of the index, right? So, uh, and it, I have a similar problem with Adani's company getting thrown out of the Dow Jones index because your formula included the company. There was a market event. There was a short selling market event. Because of that, you're throwing a company which has passed your own metric out of an index. So, I, you know, we should be very careful before we import some of this, uh, the, the hard-coded, embedded, for want of a better word, colonial uh, messaging into indices, which we then try and meet, should, we should be a little careful. I, and I talk from the financial world. Um, so this is from a 35,000 feet, and I'm going to sort of bring it to all of us and say that I've been talking of indices and broad market index. How many people here even understand that? You know, so when I'm talking of investing as uh, we are people who care about ESG, and I'm saying we should put our money um, in things which are compliant, I don't think many of us understand uh, things like the stock market well or uh, things like real return, things like um, IRR, XIRR, which is the annual rate of return, or even um, you know uh, the concept of present value, future value. So, and I'm going to come down to saying that what we po probably need, given the fact that millions of young people pour into the workforce every day, and they have no idea what to do with their personal money. So, I'm going to segue into financial education to say that there is ESG investing, I can talk about that, but we don't even understand basics of stock markets. We don't even understand basics of real return. How is it that we will transition into something as complicated as ESG investing? And if, as a society, we, are, uh, we say that ESG matters to us, our money should go into those ESG uh, happy companies, isn't it? So I will take three steps back and say we should actually start with a very deep movement to spread this sort of financial literacy in schools, in colleges. And I'm delighted to know that one of the courses sir, at, uh, I think, IGNU, the value-added course, the financial literacy course is the most sought after. And here's the thing with financial literacy. With most of the other subjects, it's a push, right? You would learn about health, you would learn about climate change, it's a push. Money is something which is a pull, because everybody wants to know what to do with their money. And it's not a bad thing. We are moving from low income to a middle income country in the next 25 years. We are not going to be a poor country. There will be disposable income. Isn't, we should definitely just focus so much more on spreading, you know, educating ourselves and then allowing children to start learning about basics of money before we even get to concepts like ESG investing. I will just pause here and, uh, you know, let, we can talk about it a bit more. Thank you so much, Monica. That was uh, very nice and very informative.